mentoring work in the year and throughout this thing. The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here
Let's just praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Sidi Aramasa, Tomo Shakoya Gorora Kolekaha. Gigi Rakamasha Ko Shokotoro Walakasha Ko. Gi Shiako Huru Walamakaha. Adonai di Aramasha Ko Shokoa Shakihi. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we just exalt your presence in our midst here this evening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Greet somebody in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is actually two lessons. Yeah. All right, come on back. Let's get ready to roll. find Josh or Brad, I guess. It's two lessons. So you figured it out. All right, here we go now. You unruly mob, you. Okay. So. We're ready to rumble. You know, I think we're all uh, kind of struggling because we've uh, been blessed so much by all these services and we've all grown to appreciate David and his ministry so deeply and, you know, we, we've become friends, we've become really close, so... I think we just need to uh, remember what we've been taught about God's uh, plans prevailing and working all things together for good. And I'm certainly not looking at this as being the end of the line here. Um, I'm sure Brother Dave is going to be back. And who knows how quickly that might transpire. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, let's just... Soak in everything that the Holy Spirit has for us today and continue to use this all as a springboard into our future with the Lord. And Brother David, come up and bring your blessing. How about a warm welcome? 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can everyone get a handout? This is a, a beefy one, 24 pages. And I brought my grandson with me, if you have yet to meet him. Jaden, stand up, please. He's, he's all of 12, but does the work of a 14-year-old. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank, thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you even more for what you're going to do. And I thank you, Father God, for the uh, word that we've hidden in our heart. And I thank you, Father God, it will continue to produce fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. I thank you, Father, as we go through this lesson tonight and how to be, be led of the Spirit, that, Father, we'll glean something significantly out of it to better serve you and to... Uh, better walk in the fullness of the plan you have for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. And as someone once said, I'm anointed to teach and demonstrate the miracle power of God at a level the world is not familiar. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And we are all anointed. Hallelujah. Well, this lesson uh, didn't have, when I designed it evidently, you know, 20-some years ago, uh, didn't have a breaking point. So uh, n usually there's, a, a, you know, uh, for each lesson um, or each session, there's two lessons. So this is session three with uh, one big one. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there's, uh, because this is presumably, at, le at least for a little season anyway, although I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging pastor that we maybe do once a month uh, so we can finish the Holy Spirit Academy. But uh, if not, those of you that are proceeding or, or planning to uh, do the, or get the certificate, uh, you can do it by, by CD or you can do it by e USB. And I think, Pastor, you got one. You, you bought the USB. So uh, Pastor's got a collection of all the, all the lessons, so you can tap him on the shoulder and maybe borrow that one or get your own either way. But uh, if you finish it, you will, we will make sure you get the certificate. Hallelujah. So this lesson is really about uh, well, being led of the Spirit. And I'm not sure how much of it we'll cover completely. But the most significant part of it is the inward witness. That's the highlight of the whole lesson, the inward witness. And how to develop that. And we've talked about that quite a bit over different lessons uh, through uh, this, the many meetings that we've had here being this is our 13th weekend, hard to believe, 13 weeks already. That's like over three months. But uh, you've heard me talk about the casting of the lot. And the casting of the lot is uh, the type and shadow of sort to the inward witness. So we're going to be digging into that tonight. So, being there's a lot of ground to cover, we'll move kind of quickly here. Okay. <laughs> Altar ministry that needs to be learned. You can't go by or depend upon what you see or hear as truth. You have to know what God knows and that you, <clears throat> and, and do that you, <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're just going to make a night tonight. <laughs> And to do that, you have to hear from him. So some examples here. When you're praying for someone, you have to go beyond what they tell you to find out what God is saying about their need or their desire. I once heard there's actually three sides to every story. One person's side, the other person's side, and then the real truth. <laughs> A couple of examples here. A woman wants you to agree with her for her, her marriage but when you inquire of the Lord, let's say that together, say them together, inquire of the Lord. That is the profound truth that we need to live by. Inquire of the Lord. Because there's always a good time to do anything or a right time to do everything. 
But, but when you, <clears throat> so this lady wants you to pray for her husband. But when you inquire of the Lord, you hear in the spirit that her husband is already remarried. So, I mean, a very innocent. She comes up here, up here to you and, and wants prayer that her husband comes back and, and, and be the man, the husband that he vowed to be and, and uh, is the father that he needs to be. And, and just pray that God will convict him to come home. That's a very legitimate, honest prayer, right? But what she didn't tell you, he's, re he's remarried. So God's not going to break up a one relationship to try to restore one that wasn't working prior to. So the point is, you know, inquire of the Lord because God will show you, you know, in, something's not right here. And you can, you know, start asking some questions. Another example, a person wants prayer for arthritis. But when you inquire of the Lord, say that, inquire of the Lord, <laughs> L333, that's good. You hear their real problem is bitterness. And I, I share that illustration a number of times with you, praying for a lady up in North Dakota, and uh, she wanted prayer for arthritis, and God said, no, the problem here is bitterness. And oftentimes, bitterness is a, a source, a, a, a significant source of a problem for arthritis. And... Uh, Again, we can, we can pray for the arthritis, but if the source of the problem is really bitterness, we're just clipping dandelions. You know, you can go out in your yard and mow down all those dandelions, and the grass looks beautiful, but the roots are still there. And uh, the idea is by inquiring of the Lord, we're going to get past the surface level to uh, what the real problem is. Another example, a person who asks for prayer for healing and nothing is seemingly happening. When you say it with me, inquire of the Lord, you hear God say that she's afraid of losing her disability or the extra attention the infirmity has given to her. And I actually had this happen right up here uh, in central northern Wisconsin. where I was there for a week, and this lady, has, I prayed for her numerous times, and nothing happened. And uh, finally, I, I didn't have all this wisdom you know, 20, 30 years ago, but uh, when, I, when I finally inquired of the Lord after four or five days of, of being there, God said the problem is she's afraid of losing her disability. And what, what was, because here she, she had this disability like 30 years, so you know, no skills, so she has become very dependent on disability. So if she got healed, What's going to happen? She has no, no, no money and no career. So it, it's a subconscious thing, really. And uh, once we dealt with a subconscious fear, then, because I said to her, I said, no, don't you think if God could heal you, he could also provide for you? And it was like a revelation. Of, oh, wow, amazing thought. So, uh, but other times people just get addicted of sort to the attention. And they're afraid of losing all that personal attention that they're getting from being catered to. So anyway, oftentimes there's things going on that you just need to inquire of the Lord to get more of the whole story. Okay, now here, I'm, I'm going to pass over this real quickly because we've talked about it more than once. And that is the deception of the, Gib the, Gib the Gibeonites. And uh, what happened is the Gibeonites came pretending to be from a faraway country. And uh, in reality, they were the next nation to be annihilated by Joshua and the team. And what happened is they deceived them to believe that they were somebody that they're not. And uh, because uh, Joshua and the team did not, did not inquire of the Lord, what happened is they made a covenant that they never should have made because it caused Israel a lot of problems in the, in the uh, <clears throat> literally, century to come. Oops. So just going down to a, a key verse here, verse number 14. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask counsel of the Lord. And uh, in the NIV it says, the men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. 
the revised standard said they took they partook of their provisions but again did not ask for, for direction from the Lord and the living Bible again not the best but interesting the way it paraphrases it Joshua and the other leaders finally believed them they did not bother to ask the Lord but went ahead and signed the peace treaty and the leaders of Israel ratified the agreement with a binding oath okay so again uh, always want to inquire of the Lord Saul's transgression and uh, this is kind of a short set of scriptures so we'll go ahead and read it so <clears throat> so Saul died for his trespass which he committed against the Lord because of the word of the Lord which he did not keep and also because he asked counsel and medium making inquire of it and did not inquire of the Lord therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, his son, Jesse. And uh, <clears throat> that was from New American Standard. And another example of Jeremiah 10, 21, it says, for the shepherds have become stupid and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they have, they have not prospered and all their flocks have scattered. NIV says it this way, the shepherds are senseless and they do not inquire of the Lord. So they, pro they do not prosper and their flock is scattered. And this is one, one reason why I so appreciate your pastors because they are diligent in seeking the counsel of God. Illustrations, pastor. This is actually a pastor here in uh, La Crosse. Uh, I was trying to remember what happened there. I know a family member died, but anyway, the, uh, the, the pastor got a word of knowledge in praying. He, 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 this pastor in the cross would go through and have a list of all of their uh, families that were in the church, and he would pray for each individual family uh, in part of his study time on a, on a regular basis and got a word from God that, that some issue was a looming danger. So he went out to their house and talked to them about it, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't bother to do anything about it. So again, sensitivity and obedience, okay? sensitivity and obedience so he did his part and he and told them but unfortunately they didn't do anything about it saturday night tv <laughs> i always chuckle at this now i haven't watched tv hardly at all uh, in probably 30 years and, and Jaden is always kind of ribbing me whenever I, I walk by a tv and says pastor don't look don't look papa so <laughs> I just, you know, I watch the Packers occasionally. I, I might have watched three games last year. But uh, for the most part, I don't watch TV. But I remember as, as a younger person, on Saturday night, they'd always have this thing on, in late Saturday night as it was going off the air and said, tomorrow morning is Sunday. Go to the church of your choice. Remember that? Well, in all honesty, you know, God, God chooses the church we're supposed to go to. So this is a good place to inquire of the Lord. Where, where do you want, Lord Jesus? Okay. God is going to lead us by the word and by the spirit. And, and these two will always be in agreement. John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Today's lesson is going to be on focus on being led of the Spirit, various ways in which God leads us by the Spirit. And uh, again, the focus is the inward witness. But there's multiple more ways that God's going to lead us, as an example, the inward voice, as well as the prophetic and other supernatural means, such as dreams, visions, personal visitations, etc. Our focus now to today is again on the inward witness. Walking in the dark, blindfolded. Actually, I played, <laughs> I went back, and, and that, the CDs that we have in this lesson go back to like 2002 or something like that. And when I first started teaching this class, I always did this demonstration. So, because we're not going to have the demonstration, I'll, we'll save us some time. But uh, let me explain to you what the demonstration was. And it was always fun. But we'd have a... a, 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 a a table, occasionally we'd use like a platform like this, but usually I used an eight-foot table. And on the table, somebody would volunteer 
to walk from one end to the other end, blindfolded. Now, in between from where they're starting to where they have to get to at the end, I'd have about six or seven mousetraps. <laughs> and I'd have little plates of water and uh, some other little obstacles along the way. So what they had to do is the person blindfolded had to be led by the person that was going to play the Holy Spirit. And they were, having, they were giving them directions to move this, move your left a little bit forward, pick it up. No, 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 no. Is this, you, can, you can imagine this scenario. But it was always fun when they hit the mousetrap. <laughs> <laughs> Hitting the water wasn't so bad. They got used to the water. But in any event, uh, it was to illustrate listening to the Holy Spirit. In this case, it was a, you know, somebody in the church, usually it was a pastor that played that part. But we need to just get that concept. We have to listen. The reality is God is always speaking. Christ in you, correct? Christ, say it with me. Christ in me. <laughs> Saying this, Christ in me. Christ in me. I know in Scripture says Christ in you, the hope of glory. But you have Almighty God, Almighty God abiding in you. And he is always wanting to have fellowship with you and communicate with you and let you know what's, what's going to best serve your day. So anyway, <clears throat> Uh, to do well, you must listen carefully and obey what you hear. First and second key again, sensitivity and obedience. Foundation to life in the spirit. Personal belief on how when a person dies, spiritually based on the word. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this because it's not really important. Really, I mean, it's important, but not significantly important. So more later in the lesson, I think, is more valuable. But essentially, let me just tell you what I believe. I believe, and I, I've never talked, I've not talked to Pastor about this, so hopefully this doesn't disagree with his, his belief, but I think it'll be okay. But I believe when, when you're born as a baby, you are perfect. Amen? But at some point in age, and there's different thoughts on when that might be, but you, you, you reach a point of a, like accountability and you know right from wrong. And when you know that and you willfully do something wrong is when you no longer are saved. But I believe babies, babies that get aborted, they go right to heaven. Amen? But at some point, uh, there's a, isn't it called the age of accountability? Age of accountability. Then you're accountable for your actions. So, but what happens is, from, from the word of God, we are the light of the world. And now, your, your candle is lit when you're born, but at some point, the candle is going to go out because of sin. So when you get born again, God's going to light your candle or relight your candle and illumine your darkness. But that will fit into this lesson, um, at least in part. So anyway, that's my personal belief. Also, I, I believe that uh, what's perfect in a baby when it's born is its spirit. Now, if a, if a mother, this is an example, is doing drugs, it's going to have an effect on the baby. Amen? If, 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 the, if the baby is born in, in, a, in a scenario where there's arguing and the baby's not really wanted, that quite probably what's going to happen is a spirit of rejection that baby is going to be born with. So anyway, there's scenarios that happen that cause babies to have challenges. And uh, I'm not going to get into that, but I just want you to know that in looking at this lesson, that fits into it a bit later on, and I'll show you here in a minute. So age of accountability, when a child willfully sins, is separated from the light and life of God. Spiritual death, just like Adam and Eve. And uh, again, Genesis 2.17, where it says there, that don't partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you do, you, you will surely die. Well, in, in Hebrew, it doesn't say surely die. It says die, die. 
and literally in Hebrew it means in dying you will die. So anyway, when that happens, spiritual death. <clears throat> and the nature of man is always to cover up. When, when man sinned, what did he do? He covered up, right? He covered up the, the, the nakedness with a fig leaf. That's just the, the nature of man. He wants to cover up sin. Now, Proverbs 20, 27, it says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of the being. And King James says this way, the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. When you willfully sin at an age of accountability, your light goes out and you enter into a world of darkness. Ephesians 5.8 it says, you were formerly darkness, but now where you light of the Lord, walk as children of light. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called, this, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise God. When you recognize your sin and accept Jesus as your Savior, then you are translated out of darkness into light. In Proverbs 18, it says, For thou dost light my lamp, the Lord my God illuminates my darkness. And uh, I'm going to skip the other ones here. John 14 through 16. Uh, interesting three passages here that work together in um, <clears throat> being led by the Holy Spirit. Let's just go through it real quickly. John 14, 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, when the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, all that I have said to you. And uh, actually, well, that's just a good point right there. Coming up to another point here, I want to make for you, though. John 16 says, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has, has are mine. Therefore, I said, he takes of mine, and he will disclose it to you. Amen. S showing us here about the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the part I thought I was going to come to, but it's here right now in these three verses. By implication, what we're going to see here is the two different ways that God's going to lead us. And that's by the Word and by the Spirit. Now, John 15, 26 says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness of me. Okay? Speaking of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is going to lead us. Are you following me? Holy Spirit is going to bear witness with you in, in, that you are the Spirit. Bear witness of me, Jesus. Now here, number 27 says, and you, who is, who is the you that he's speaking of here? The disciples. Okay, the disciples, and you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. So that makes it more clearly that he's talking about the disciples. How did the disciples bear witness? They, they gave us the Gospels. Amen. Matthew, Mark, John. I almost said Luke, but Luke wasn't one of the disciples. But they, they gave us the word. So what you're going to see, what you see here in these in these two verses is the two ways God's lead, God leads you. Number one, by the Spirit, bearing witness with your spirit, bearing witness with your spirit that Jesus is Lord, and by the written word. But now here, what's significant is why. What is the benefit of being led by the Spirit, being led by the Word? It says here, these things. What things? I'm going to lead you by my Spirit. I'm going to lead you by my word. These things I've spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. That word, um, let me go through my notes here because I'll repeat it twice here. <clears throat> God will always warn you of danger to keep you from stumbling or falling away. When, when tragedies happen, we can, out, can almost always see that somewhere someone missed God. And 
I can always I can always point to my mistakes. I can look and say, oh, I missed it here, I missed it there. But the, the, the point is the Holy Spirit will always warn you of danger, but we have to be sensitive. And uh, this, oh, so I have my notes here now. I'm pretty sure I have it on the next page. The Greek word here. No, I don't. Okay, well, that, this word stumbling block, or keep you from stumbling, that is the Greek word skandalizo. And uh, it means to cause you to stumble. But also, in King James, it says, to keep you from being offended. It's the same word that we see, uh, actually, the root word, the scandalizo, scandalon, which is where we get the word scandal, where Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. That word offense is the Greek word scandalon. And it means to, to, it's a trap. And it's a part of the trap specifically that the bait is a trap attached to. Because what the devil does is he tries to cause you to stumble. And I, I wish I had more time to, to demonstrate this, but um, when, when, I, when I was an, a teenager, I tried for track. And uh, I, I thought that was probably my best, my, my best sport. Because, Jaden, don't listen to this, okay? Just close your ears. <laughs> I, was, I was a bad, rebellious boy. And I had a speedboat and never had enough gas, so I was the Robin Hood of the neighborhood. And then borrow other, pieces, other people's gas, and I was my own benefactor. So I got very good at running, because I was being chased, with a five-gallon gas can. So when I went out for track, the, the most logical event for me w sounded like the hurdles. The problem th with the hurdles is, uh, you've heard this before, talking about rhythm and my inability to clap on time or sway right. I'm swaying right, and they're swaying left, and we collide. But I think I was in the outhouse when rhythm was handed out. I was not at the meeting. So... <laughs> In, uh, in, in jumping fences, that wasn't hard because it was just one. But with track, you got a series of them. And, and you need rhythm. And I always got the first one or two okay, but about the third or the fourth one, invariably I smacked it and I came down on my knees and I didn't like blood, especially my own. So... In pulling the little gravel out of my knees and, and, and wiping the blood off, I, I decided I don't like track. So I was going to quit. And, and, and the point of the story is what the devil wants to do is to get you offended, get you to stumble so that you stop running the race. We're called to run a race. Well, God's got a plan. He's got a race for it. And uh, what happens is if the devil can get you offended, he'll get you into a different race. He'll get you into something. And that's what happened to me. As I said to the coach, I said, Coach, you know, if we put these hurdles in the woods, scatter them around, I know I can do really well. <laughs> but he said, it doesn't work like that. So I, I quit. But I didn't just quick quit. I decided to do the long jump, the rod jump. And there you just jump once and you land in sand. I mean, that just made good sense to me. And although I did well, quite probably it wasn't the race God had planned for me. Amen. And this is why I wanted to highlight this here because so many people are missing the plan that God has for their life because they got offended. And so, again, that's really one important reason, again, why, why Jesus said, listen to me, listen to my spirit, listen to my word, so that you can be right dab in the middle of my will, amen, and you're not going to be offended. Okay. All knowledge, is, all knowledge is in us, as God is in us, God is all-knowing. He knows what was going to happen before it is even known to us. Okay, working our way to the meat of the message here. We need to tap into the knowledge 
of God. We need to know what he knows. And as the Bible says, we, ha we have not because we ask not. And uh, that's James 4, 2, 3. You can read it later there. Foundation principle, we are a spirit being. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We are made in his image, amen, according to Genesis 126. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. That's, that's our three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. And you see that in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Soul is made up, we talked about this before, of three parts. Your will, your emotions, and your thoughts. I think of it as WET, an acronym, WET, W-E-T, will, emotions, and thought. And your, your will is your ability to choose, your emotions, your ability to feel, and your thoughts, your ability to think. The, the, way, the way to ultimate victory and fullness of blessings is to prosper the soul. And that's what 3 John 2 says, where it says, Beloved, I pray. That word pray, yukamihi in the Greek, means to will, to pray, or to earnestly desire. God's will for us is to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. So I'm highlighting this because as we're looking at the casting of the lot, as we're looking at this inward witness, we have to prosper our soul. We have to make a choice to uh, uh, say yes or say no. We have to prosper our soul, our will, our ability to choose. And uh, we'll get more into that here in a little bit. But Romans 8, 5, for those who are, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And you know what, rather than go through all of that, you know those verses. The verse 16, the spirit himself, the spirit himself, verse 16, bears witness with our spirit, spirit to spirit communication. Spirit to spirit communication. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I believe the devil, as we've looked at in 2 Corinthians 2.11, his devices is to exercise our mind. The devil's going to speak to your mind. God's going to speak to your spirit. Now, sometimes it's hard to separate the, the head and, and, and the heart, but the primarily tr valuable truth is the, the spirit speaking primarily to your spirit. So now what we want to look at is developing the inward witness. Looking into, again, to do this, we're going to look at types and shadows. And we looked at this a little bit a couple of weeks ago as we looked at uh, uh, was it the Red Sea crossing. I think it was the Red Sea crossing. We looked at Moses' tabernacle a little bit. No. A couple of times, I think we have touched on it. Well, anyway, Moses' tabernacle is a picture of the coming of Christ. It's a picture of the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, each there's three tabernacles or temples. you got Moses' tabernacle, again, which is a type and shadow. That means everything represents something, kind of an illustration, every color, every fabric, every size, every dimension has a, a type and shadow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll go through that, some of the examples here in a little bit. Uh, but then after Moses' tabernacle, which is the coming of Christ, okay, in the Holy Spirit, then we have David's uh, tent, David's tabernacle, where Moses' tabernacle was very ornate. David's temple was very simple, a tent. And uh, interestingly, the, the tent was erected for three and a half years. And uh, in, in Acts 15, I think it is, it says God in, in, in the church age is going to restore the tabernacle of David. Now, David wanted to build a tabernacle. David wanted to build a temple. But God said, no, because you're a man of war. So because he was a man of war, he could not build the temple but he said, your son can. So Solomon built the temple. God did say, David, you can, you can, you can 
uh, sow into it. And he did. Lots and lots of money. Like we can sow into the tabernacle of Solomon, which is the millennial age. So David's, David's tabernacle re represents the church age. Solomon's temple represents the millennial age. Solomon was, uh, never had war. David had war all of, all of, his, all of his kingship, always war. But, and that's why he could and he, and God said, you're a man of blood. So you can't build me a temple. But you, got, you, know, but you can, again, uh, build a tent. And some people say, you know, there's not a lot in the Bible about praise and worship. Well, true, but the type and shadow of praise and worship is David. And David wrote a whole bunch of psalms and a whole bunch of scriptures about praise and worship. So David's tabernacle, again, Acts 15, says, After these things I'll return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will build its ruins, and I will restore it, in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. And again, Solomon's temple is a picture of the millennial reign of Christ. And Solomon never had war. He had peace and prosperity the whole time. Okay, now, of major interest, though, for us tonight is Moses' tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle, everything represents something. Exodus 25, 8, it says, And let them con construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of, pat, pattern of the tabernacle and pattern of its furniture, just so you shall construct it. Colors, dimensions, shapes, patterns, etc., all have symbolic representation. Examples of types and shadows of the tabernacle, only one entrance, and that was the narrow gate. And we can see in Matthew 7 where it says there that enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and wide is the broad and, and, and wide and broad is the broad th that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life. Few are those who find it. So the, in the, in Moses' tabernacle, which again is rectangular in shape, and uh, at the east end is a very narrow gate, and that's the only entrance on the east end. Uh, Psalm 100, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Now, there are seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. And within the seven pieces of furniture, there's an outer court, there's an inner court, and then there's a holy of holies. In the outer court, you have two pieces of furniture. You have the brazen altar, and then you have the uh, brazen laver. Out in the outer court, it's, the, it's brass and wood. The, the brazen altar was brass covering wood. The brazen altar, uh, brazen laver, I'm sorry, was all brass. And it was filled with water, which created like a mirror type of a thing. But you, you remember through the Old Testament, thousands and thousands and thousands of sacrifices, those were usually offered on the brazen altar. That's where atonement was made for sin. And then, even though their sins were forgiven through the shedding of an innocent blood, innocent blood of animals, even though they were, they were, their sins were atoned for, they still had to be cleansed of, of any unrighteousness so that that's where the brazen labor came in, that they would wash ceremonially, basically, even though there was some dust and crud on their feet and so forth. But they would do that ceremonially to go into the inner court. Now, once you're in the inner court, on the left is the table of showbread. And the table of showbread is gold over wood. And this represents the body of Jesus Christ. Remember, unto us a child is born. Isaiah 9, 6. Who was the child that was born? Jesus, humanity. Okay, so the wood represents humanity. 
Unto us a son is given. Who is the son that was given? Christ. That's deity. So deity is represented by gold, humanity, by wood. So that's the table of showbread. Then right in front of you would be the altar of uh, incense. That represents the prayers and intercession of the saints. And then on the right would be the golden candlestick. And the golden candlestick represents the Holy Spirit, or in Revelation it refers to the seven spirits of the Lord. Okay. Well, on our list here, we've covered all that. Uh, okay, page nine. Covered that brazen labor. Even though we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, our sins are forgiven. We still have to get regular cleansing. And that's 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Okay, we went through all the different. Okay, we didn't go to the Holy of Holies yet. Okay, so then, so in the inner court, you got the table of, God bless you. You have the table of showbread, altar of incense, and the, the, the seven candlesticks. But then you have this massive curtain that separates the inner court from the Holy of Holies. And then behind that Holy of Holy curtain is the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. And they were only visited really once per year on the Day of Atonement. And uh, so those are the seven pieces of furniture. Now, just some types and shadows uh, along the way here. The setup of the, the tribes were quite interesting. If you go to the book of Numbers, it tells you there in the book of Numbers that these tribes are on the north, and it has the number. These tribes are on the south, it has the number. These are on the east, and these are on the west. Now, it's interesting. There's no southwest coordinate or northeast coordinate. Those, they're, 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 they're open areas. But if you, if you put on a piece of graph paper and, and uh, drew the tabernacle, which is just a rectangle, and then you, you plotted all the squares, say, say you know, um, 100, 100, for every 100 people, a tiny little X on a graph paper. That what, what you would have, what you would create when you plotted all of the different tribes and their numbers, you would see you created a cross. Isn't that incredible? I, I just think that's so incredible. And then the tribe of Levi, so the, the, the 11 tribes, north, south, east, west, but the tribe of Levi was in the middle. And the tribe of Levi is a priestly tribe, and Jesus is our high priest that was crucified for us. So just a lot of symbology uh, in the tabernacle. Uh, the focus of the type and shadow that which relate, relates to the inward witness that we're going to dig into tonight, <clears throat> and always being, the inward witness is always being in the right place at the right time, is given to us in the priestly wardrobe. And we're going to see the priestly wardrobe in Exodus 28, starting in verse number 28. It says, And they shall bind the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord. Blue always speaks of spiritual or heavenly. Blue speaks of heavenly or spiritual. That it may be skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breastplate may not come loose from the ephod. Okay, next page. <clears throat> and Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of judgment. Breastplate of judgment could also be translated breastplate of decision. Because when you're making a, a judgment, you're making a decision. So the breastplate of judgment, or breastplate of decision, and it's over the heart. Now again, we're talking about type and shadows, we're talking about symbolic, symbology. So we have a breastplate of judgment, and in that breastplate of judgment, we're gonna see two stones are gonna be placed in that breastplate of judgment, the Orim and the Tumim. But interestingly, 
is over the heart. And where does God communicate with you? In the heart, in the spirit. Now, almost always, not always, but almost always throughout the word of God, in the, particularly in the Old Testament, when, when you see the word heart is really related to spirit. But some two different times, you have spirit and heart in the same verse. But that's where God's going to communicate with you, you know, again, by the spirit or within the heart. Okay, I'm reading the verse again here. Aaron shall carry the names of the son of Israel in the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And ye shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Oreen and the Tumim. Now, I know it looks like Urim and Thummim, and that's what most people pronounce it that way. But if you look down in your notes here further down, um, page, ne the next page, page 11, you can see the words Oreen and Tumim and their phonetic pronunciations. So you as best as I can tell, where it says 224 Orim, O O hyphen R E E M, looks like Orim to me. <laughs> so, anyway, Orim and the Tumim. So, these are the two stones that are placed in the breastplate of judgment over the heart. And they're, they're bound with a blue lace, spiritual, I indicating spiritual or heavenly. Okay, breastplate of judgment, the will or the place of decision making. Remember, the will, the ability to choose, part of your prospering your soul. So if we want to prosper our soul, we need to inquire of the Lord and uh, respond according to whatever he might say. Okay, now <clears throat> the Orim and Tumim are supernatural guidance system of the priest. And we'll, we'll dig into this in a little bit, but what we're going to see is they are, again, the supernatural guidance system through the casting of the lot. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit only spoke at sundry times primarily through the prophet, the priest, and the king. But the, the, uh, the king primarily needed to have direction all the time, just like you and I. We need to, you know, all the time know what to do and how to do it. But again, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, it was limited to the prophet, priest, and king. And again, the supernatural guidance system was the casting of the lot. Now, the Orim and Tumim are, okay, we better read. Numbers 27, it says, verse 16, May the Lord, the God of all spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them, who will lead them out and will bring them in, and the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep with no shepherds. So follow along here, the, how to go out, how to come in, okay? Number 18, so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. This is the first occasion, I believe, where we see laying out of hands for impartation. Verse 19, and have him stand before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation and commission him in their sight. And you shall put some of your authority, see this is the impartation, you shall put some of your authority on him in order that the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. Moreover, he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall inquire of him by the judgment of the Orim before the Lord. At his command they shall go out, and at his command they shall come in, both he and all the sons of Israel, with him, even all the congregation. So again, wherever we see Orim, you can assume it means Orim and Tumim, it, which is basically the, the supernatural guidance system. But almost always it's shortened to just Orim. Very seldom do we see both of them together, but they work as a tandem set. Now, Proverbs 16.33 gives us a little clue in how they work. It says, the lot 
is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Now, so as best as I can tell, now we don't have these stones anymore. What we do know is they were supernatural. But as best as we could tell, there was a supernatural system in them. And I, 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 the way I picture them is inscriptions on one side that said, yes, imagine a, a small skipping stone that went into a pouch. And on one side, the inscription was yes. And on the other side, the inscription was no. So the, the supernatural in this case is how they would land as opposed to how they would function. Some people say they, you know, we don't have them. It's a speculation. Some people would speculate and say, you know, there was something supernatural in them that would light up or, or something like that. Again, could be. We don't know. But based on my study of Scripture, I think what I'm telling you here is the most accurate based on the totality of Scripture in that the, the supernatural part of it is how they land. So if you have two stones in your hand, and they're, when you throw them down on the ground, or actually you throw them into the lap, the priest's lap, when you throw them into the lap, they're going to land one of three ways. Yes, yes, no, no, or yes, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I believe the supernatural is in the navigating how they land. Now this verse says it this way. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So, you know, again, however they determined it, God's behind it. But assuming this is the accurate means, yes, yes, if you're going to ask God a question, shall we go to war? If, if it's yes, yes, then the answer is yes. If it's no, no, the answer obviously is no. And if the answer is yes, no, what you, what's God saying? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Seriously, we yes, no means God is not speaking. There's no answer. And, and I know you can probably relate to this. I can relate to this. And the reason there's no answer, the re and we'll see this in Scripture, by the way. I'll prove it to you by Scripture. But the reason it comes up, yes, no, one primary reason is sin. You're outside of fellowship. You're outside of right relationship. And we'll see that demonstrated by Saul in, I think it's Acts 23. But I mean, I mean First Chronicles chapter 23. Now, the other reason... I, I believe that we get yes, no, is God has already spoken. He's already given you a directive. So as an example, how was God going to lead us? By his word or by the spirit. So if you're, you're, you have a fancy desire to get married to an unbeliever, and you're saying, God, is it going to be okay? I, I believe this person's a good person. I believe this person will finally, at some point, get saved. So you're inquiring of the Lord, is it going to be okay to get married to this person? There's no answer. Why? He's already spoken in his word. Do not be yoked to a non-believer. So you're going to get a yes, no. Another example that I can relate to is you, you, you know you're called to go to Bible school, and six months into Bible school, all hell comes against you. And this goes wrong, and that goes wrong, and you're out of money, and, and, and it's just all kinds of things are going wrong, and you're saying, God, did I make a mistake? Is, did, did I, and, and, uh, what's wrong here? Should I quit? No answer. Why? God's not like some finicky people that change their mind every month or two. You with me? I know pastors can appreciate this because how many people, pastor, come and say, yes, this is in the church God's called me to. Three months later, they're gone for different reasons, okay? So yes, no is I perceive one of two things. There's, there's sin or he's already spoken. Now, if you have an issue with that, pastor will be happy to talk to you about it. 
<laughs> oh, don't you love me, Pastor? You have to. New, New Testament examples. Here we go. Matthew five thirty seven. Let your and, and this is one reason why I, I, I you know again I, I believe this is the right interpretation of these stones because we have these scriptures. Matthew five thirty seven says, "Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, and anything beyond this is evil." Second Corinthians seven one seventeen. Paul said, "Therefore I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I?" Or that which is I purpose to do, I purpose according to the flesh. That with me there should be yes and yes and no, <clears throat> yes and no and no at the same time. But God, but as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him or yes and amen. For as, many as, <clears throat> for as many as may be promises of God in him, they are yes. Wherefore, also by him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Amen. Yes, <clears throat> yes, or no, no represents the absoluteness of God. With him, everything is either black or white, and lukewarm is detestable to him, which would be the yes, no. The words Urim, Arim, and Tumim. Again, 224 in Strong's is the Greek word, I mean, Hebrew word, Orim, and it means stones. Stones kept in a pouch on a high priest's breastplate used in determining God's decision in certain questions and issues. This is from Strong's Concordance. Plural of 217 which means lights, plural, because there's two. Two yeses and two noes. Plural, <clears throat> orim, the, the oracle brilliancy of the figures in the high priest breastplate. Coming from, the, well, the definition of the root word here, or, means uh, flame, a light of a fire. Hence, plural, the east as being the region of light. So basically, in King James, this, is, this word is translated as fire or light. Now, to me means perfection. <clears throat> and the definition says, stones provided by the means of our, our achieving a sacred lot. They were used with the orim, this is how the will of God was revealed. It's a plural again because there's two. And again, it means perfections. One of the epaulets of the objects in the high priest breastplate as an emblem of complete truth. Again, the root word, tomb, from 8522, means completeness, figuratively, prosperity, usually moral or morally innocence. Translated, um, integrity, completeness, fullness, innocence, simplicity, and integrity. In integrity, in King James, you find it translated full, integrity, perfect, simplicity, uprightness, at a venture. Now, these two stones, my perception is, these two stones represent the life and the light of God. And again, the light, perfection, completeness, innocence, prosperity, God's life, and his light, his light, his flame, his fire. And again, these two stones is what we receive when we are born again. Psalm 43, 3, it says, O send out thy light and thy truth, O Reem, and to me. Send out thy light and thy truth. Let them do what? Lead me. God's going to lead you by the light and by the truth. Let them bring me to thy holy hill and to thy dwelling places. Applications of the Urim and the Tumim. 
And uh, we're actually going to go backwards here. We're going to start at the end of uh, Samuel and move forward and backwards. But we talked about this here a few weeks back. 1 Samuel 28. Now Samuel was dead, and all of Israel lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. So the Philistines gathered together and came and camped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all of Israel together and camped in Geboa. When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, neither by dreams, nor by Orim, or by prophets. Now, so often we miss the, the supernatural by looking to the spectacular. And the inward witness is very supernatural, but it might not seem so spectacular. You know, dreams and visions or prophetic word, you know, might be more spectacular, but the everyday, everyday leading is going to be by the inward witness. So what, what, what the, the scripture is telling us here, God wasn't answering in any event. The, the everyday supernatural, the Orim, nor by the spectacular prophets and, 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 and uh, dreams and visions. But now the reason is sin. There was an issue in Saul's heart. The issue was his, his, his religious mindset did the right things, but his heart wasn't given to it. We can see he, he did what Saul said, but his heart wasn't in it. He got rid of all the spiritists, tore down all the Asherah poles. He did the right things that religion would do. Are you hearing me? <laughs> but God is not looking for religious actions. He's looking for hearts. And, and, and uh, sacrifice is better than obedience. We, we, we need to sacrifice whatever to honor God. In, in doing the right thing. So because God could see this and he knew and he knows what you're going to do before you do it. He knew his heart wasn't right. His heart was not in it. And you can always tell when a person's heart is, is not right because when things aren't going right, they fear. When you have a right relationship with God, you're not going to so easily be afraid. You're going to have confidence in knowing his word is true. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. His seed is never being beg seed begging bread. But because his heart wasn't right, when the Philistines were gathered around them, he was afraid. And he, he approached God in fear, and God did not answer him. So because God knew what was going to happen next, we see the next verse, which says, then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So God knew before he did this that if God withheld an answer, he would go to the witch of Endor. His confidence and trust was not in God. That's why it came up, yes, no. Uh, again, God was not answering by the everyday supernatural, with the Orim and Tumim, or by the spectacular supernatural of the prophetic or dreams. Saul did all the right things religiously, but his heart was not right. Sin was in his heart, and sin stops, hinders communication with God. 1 Samuel 15, 22, and, God sa and Samuel said, has the Lord as, the, as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Belo behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and also, <clears throat> and to heed than the fat of our, our rams. Interestingly, Saul knew that sin stopped the flow, but chose not to deal with it as it was within himself. So often we point to others' sin but are unwilling to deal with it on our own. 
Now we're going to look at another example here, and that's why I said that. But in another example, the sin, I mean, again, God was not answering. The, the lot was cast, Orim was cast, but it always came up yes, no. In this case, Saul dealt with it because he knew, and we're going to see what the scripture says, Saul said, see where the sin is. But where was the sin in his, in his son? So it's always easier to deal with someone else's sin than your own. Amen? Saul casting the lot. This is in 1 Samuel uh, 14, 3. And it says, And Hijah, the son of Ahab, Ichabob's brother, and the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of the Lord at Shiloh, was wearing an ephod, and the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Now, the importance of just putting this verse in there in verse 3 is because where is the Orim and the Tumim? In the breastplate of judgment within the ephod. And the priest carried the ephod. So what we see is in, in 1 Samuel 14, 3, the priest was there with the ephod, and by presumption he has the Orim and Tumim which are going to be used later in the story. So what happens between verse 3 and verse 36 is Jonathan and his armor bearer go out and they're, they're surveying the, the enemy camp. And they come across a garrison of, of people. And, and Jonathan puts out a fleece and says, Lord, if you want us to play havoc here and take on this garrison, let me know. So he cast the lease out under the, the fleece, and he and his armor bearer single-handedly wiped out the entire garrison. Now, I forget how many, how many a garrison is, but it's a bunch of people. But they annihilated a whole bunch of them, and then they started killing themselves. An incredible victory. Now, because of that victory, the entire Philistine camp came into disarray. And they started killing themselves all over the place. Saul, from his vantage point, was looking down on all of this carnage that was happening in the enemy camp. And he says, whoa, what a great opportunity. Let's go down there and annihilate all of them now that they're all killing themselves. And it'll be an easy wipeout for us. I mean, for, get rid of them. But the wise priest we're going to look at, his wisdom, and, and the importance of this is, don't go by what you see in ministry. Don't go by what you see. Don't go by what you hear. You need to do what? Choir of the Lord. Amen. So, again, that's, that's the moral of this whole story, that the wise priest, don't, Saul, I, mean, I, I see what you see, and it looks like an incredible opportunity, but you don't know what God knows. So we want to get his opinion. So jumping down to verse 36, we'll pick up the story from there. Then Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and take spoil among them until the morning light and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. So the priest said, let us draw near to God here. So what, what does Saul do? He inquires of God. He inquires of the Lord. And what does he say? Shall I go down? Now, what's interesting, and we'll see this through a number of examples, but the stones can only answer yes and no questions. And it's, there's, some wise, there's some wisdom in that because so often we want to get paragraphs or pages of information, but the simplicity of the inward witness is yes or oh, no, very simple. And it's not always a yes or a no. I mean, it is a yes or a no, but sometimes it's a check. Sometimes it shows itself as a peace or just kind of a feeling like something's not right. But it's all in the same family, yes or no. So, <clears throat> verse 37, Saul inquired of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? He gets a yes and no question. Wilt thou give them into my hand, into the hand of Israel? Yes, no question. But notice, he, God, did not answer him that day. 
And Saul said, draw here, here. I got King James memorized, and I'm reading the American Standard. And Saul said, draw near here, all you chief of the people, and investigate and see how this sin has happened today. See, Saul knew that when God wasn't answering, there's a reason for that, and it's usually sin. So he's, a, he's willing to deal with it because it's not his sin. It wasn't his doing. It was his son. Now, you know, fathers in general never want to believe that, you know, your son could ever do something wrong, even though ten people are saying differently. <laughs> but just imagine this. I mean, I, I just... I, I, this scene, I, I love this picture because I love honey. And man, I, I shared that with you before, but I cannot dip a spoon into the honey pot or the, the jar and get out a, you know, a spoon of honey. And I, it, it used to be worse because I had a mustache. I could not get a spoon of honey without getting sticky. It's just, John, I look at your full beard and I, I admire it, but that, that's, a, that's a bad place for honey. And, you know, this, Jonathan and his armor bearer and all these guys, they had big, bushy beards. And now what, what happened was Jonathan took his rod. I mean, he's weary from, from the battle, wiping out the whole garrison, he and his armor bearer. So they're weary, and he, he dips the, the tip of his rod into the honeycomb. And so I'm, I'm just seeing this big glob of honey and just... And I can just picture the beard. You know, it's just sticky all over. And he didn't know, he, he had no idea he did anything wrong. He wasn't there when, when, when Saul gave the command. But the, did we read the command yet? No, well, the command is that whoever, does, whoever disobeys me is going to die. So he was totally innocent. But look at this, verse 39. For as the Lord lives, whoever who, who delivers Israel, though it be in, in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But not one of the people answered him. Then said, then he said to all of Israel, You shall be on one side, and I and Jonathan, will, my son, will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, Do what seems good to you. Now here is the simplicity of the casting of the lot. It's what I call deductive reasoning. And essentially, you have to draw a line. And what happens is, he's going to put Israel on one side of the line, and then he and his son on the other side. So they'll cast the lot over here is the sin this day in Israel. So what's going to happen? It's going to come up, no, no. Well, by deduction, that means the sin's over here. But when they did it on the other side, is the, is the sin in, in Jonathan or, or King Saul? Yes. So they draw another line or use the same line over again, and they put Saul on one side and Jonathan on the other side. Again, narrowing it down, asking yes and no questions. And we're going to see here that Saul escapes, but Jonathan is taken by the casting of the lot. So let's read it. Verse 41. Therefore Saul said to the Lord, the God of Israel, give a perfect lot. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me without what you have done. So Jonathan told him and said, I indeed tasted a little honey with the end of the staff that was in my hand, and here I am, I must die. And Saul said, May God do this to me and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Well, he doesn't do anything to Jonathan, and we won't try to unravel that rat's nest. But you can see how the casting of the lot works. You have to draw a line, and you can only ask yes and no questions. 
Key premise of the, the entire lesson, not going by the obvious, by what a situation looks like. Again, the wise priest. Let's inquire of the Lord. Inquiring of the Lord, asking counsel of the Lord. Note that Saul recognized here that sin was the reason that God was not speaking, and in this scenario, he was willing to deal with it. A drawing of the line and a setting up of the simplistic simplicity of the Orim and Atumim in that they can only answer yes and no questions. A deductive process of elimination to get where you want. Illustration of planning a vacation with the same principle. You might say, okay, let me apply this to a vacation. So you might inquire of the Lord, the Father, is, will it be good for me to take a vacation this year? And yes or no. Okay, you got a yes. Okay, now we have to figure out when to take the vacation. So we'll put the spring and winter in one basket, and we'll put uh, fall and summer in the other basket. So, okay, we've got to draw a line. Shall we go in, 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 in winter or spring? Yes or no? No. Okay, then we should go in summer or fall. So you put summer on one, fall on the other, and then you just keep narrowing it down. So you, you say, okay, July. Okay, shall we go the first week of July? Yes or no? Okay, but it's the deductive process narrowing it down to you get to where you want to go. Now, let's look at an example here from David. David casting the lot. 1 Samuel 23, two, 6. Now, it came about when Abibathar, the son of Abimelech, fled to Keilah, David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Again, the same principle here. We have the priest with the ephod, which has the Orim and the Tumim. So we skip down to verse number 9. And David knew that, that Saul was planning evil against him, so he said to Abibathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Now, does he want the ephod? What does he really want? He wants direction, right? He, he wants the stones. Again, but bringing the ephod accomplished that. Okay, verse 10. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, now notice again, yes and no questions. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath heard that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city from my account. Here's the question. Will the men of Keilah surrender me to his hand? Yes or no? Will Saul come down just as thy servant has heard? Yes and no. <clears throat> o Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Yes. Verse 12. Then David said, Will the man of Keilah surrender me into, and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, Yes. Translated, they will surrender you. Note again the simplicity of yes and no questions. Now, <clears throat> again, the word and the spirit always agree, and this is a perfect example right here. The children of Israel receiving their inheritance by the casting of the lot. A confirmation of what was prophesied in Genesis 49, hundreds of years earlier by Jacob on his deathbed, as he spoke over his 12 sons, that where they would dwell in the promised land. Again, so here's Jacob on his deathbed, prophesying over the 12 sons and uh, and. Uh, if you read through there, what you'll see is a lot of the prophetic word were boundaries. Boundaries in the land of Canaan, Canaan, which would happen hundreds and hundreds of years later. Okay, so that's the prophetic word in Genesis 49. Now, come to Joshua 14, and it says, Now these are the territories which the son of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eliezer the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the households of the tribes of the son of Israel apportioned to them for an inheritance. Notice, by lot, by the lot of their inheritance as the Lord commanded through Moses for the nine tribes 
and the half tribe because the other tribes had already received their inheritance on the other side of the river. Now, from here through chapter 21, the lot was cast to determine the boundaries of the 12 tribes, and it confirms exactly the prophecies of Genesis 49. Again, hundreds of years later, they cast the lot to determine their boundaries, and it confirmed perfectly the prophecies of Genesis 49. Again, the spirit and the word will always agree. If you get something different than what the word says, you're hearing from the wrong spirit. So as an example, in the illustration of shall I, can I go ahead and get married to this heathen? I know that uh, it'll, it'll turn out okay. Again, if you say God said yes, you heard the wrong spirit. But God will never disagree with his word. The foundation of casting of the lot into the New Testament and receiving of our inheritance, which is the casting of the lot. Ephesians 1.11, it says, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose, his purpose, who works all things together after the counsel of his will. Okay? God's predetermined will for all men is that none would perish, but do some go to hell? Yes. 1 Timothy 2.4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And uh, King James says it much the same way. And then uh, 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow about his promises, as, as some count slowness but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Even though it is God's will, desire for no, no one to go to hell, every day it happens. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Because even though God has a predetermined will for all men to be saved, not all men get saved because they have a will of their own. Same thing with you and I. God's got a predetermined destiny for you, but your fulfilling it, walking in the fullness of it, is going to be your ability to be sensitive and obedient to his leading. And in other words, we have some responsibility, even though we're predestined to be great men and women of God. Now, <clears throat> continuing on the bottom of page 15, God also wills that we prosper and be in health. But the key to that prosperity and health is the prosper prosperity of our soul. To effectively prosper our soul, we have to make a determination to renew our mind and choose to inquire of the Lord and then to obey whatever he says. First two keys of the supernatural, again, sensitivity and obedience. In Isaiah 119, if you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. Like anything, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. Illustration of practicing on turning left or right. I've told you that story about casting the lot. Did everyone hear that? Yay, nay. I think, okay, real simply, you know, when I got this, when I got this, this concept, and this was back when my daughter was only three years old, and she's 38 now, so it's 35 years ago, I started practicing and teaching this, this concept. And I literally practiced every day, every day. I, and everything I did, shall I turn left, shall I turn right? And I had some wild goose chases. And, and the one I share with you, I, I forgot one part of the story when I played this tape yesterday coming up here, but I, I was traveling through Missouri and I needed gas. And, uh, and so my, you know, I need gas. And obviously, there's a ga gas station right there. So, you know, it's kind of stupid to think, shall I ask God if I should get gas? But I'm doing this stupid thing because I'm practicing. So shall I exit? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I get to the stop sign. Shall I turn right? The gas station's right there. And God said no. 
Now, I predetermined that as best as I could discern that yes and no, that when it went against my logic, went against my thinking of what I should do, I, I was going to obey what I thought I should do based on the impression that I had. So I turned left. And I'm going through wilderness nowhere. And I, I know I'm probably running on fumes at some point. And, and then I, I ended up back on the highway. And I'm saying, God, what was that all about? And he reminded me, and this is the part I forgot when I told you the story before. He reminded me a year prior, we were on the same basic section of highway, and we were going from, uh, probably going home for Christmas, from Tulsa, and a car started passing me on the left, and I'm following a truck, and then all of a sudden, so I have nowhere to go, there's a car on my left, truck in front of me, he loses a, a tire, a, the recap, and it's coming bouncing at me. And I had nothing to do except hit it. And it did like $2,000 of damage to the car and the underneath the car, and we lost two days getting it fixed right before Christmas. So anyway, God brought that, brought that memory to me that even though it made no sense for me to go on this wild goose chase through the wilderness, maybe I avoided something. I, I don't know. He never really told me for certain. He just brought that to my memory. He also, what I did tell you is another s scenario is when I'm, I'm putting gas into the car at the gas station and I'm still trying to figure out what was this all about. And he, and he reminded me of a, just the week before I was putting gas in my car in, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and uh, all of a sudden I see a car that wasn't parked properly and a quick trip kind of a thing. And the guy jumped out of his car and the car rolled down and hit a person right next to me that was filling the car up with gas and ended up going to the hospital. Again, you know, I don't know, but you know, God knows how to protect us. Amen. And then, I've told you this story, but for those that didn't hear it, I'm actually going up Highway 41. I'm going up to uh, Marquette. I'm going up to Marquette for, for a meeting in Marquette. But I'm going up Highway 41, and I have a, a, a lunch planned with a pastor in Cribbets. And, you know, this is long, this is 35 years ago, long before cell phones. And I'm sitting in a stop sign. Now I know I have to turn left on Highway C to go to the parsonage, that I mean, the, the church that they're being built. I know I have to do that. But I'm, 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 I'm following this protocol of practice. Why? Practice makes perfect. And, you know, it, it makes me think about when I started driving, you know, um, again, rhythm. I, I missed out on rhythm for whatever the reason. And when I started driving, I, I know God did not design the stick shift car. Because he gave us two feet, and the, the car companies gave us three pedals. And I think my dad was a little sadistic because he took pleasure in teaching me on the stick shift on a four-way stop sign. On a hill. And I, my heart would start racing. I mean, just, just the thought of going to the hill. Wait, no, Dad, no, no. Yeah. And I knew what would happen. I would, I, I'd kill the car, and I'd wave cars around me, and then I'd start it up, and then I'd kill it again. And it was just a bad scene. And, and it took me three times to pass my driver's test on a stick shift. Of course, hitting a car one time probably didn't help, but uh, I just didn't have the rhythm. So, but after practicing many, many years in, in our first ministry van was a stick shift. And, you know, now go cross country and not even think about shifting. You know, it just it's, it's becomes automatic. And that's what this, in the walk in the spirit, that's what God wants it to be, automatic. That we're so in tune to the Holy Spirit. That we're, we're so trained, as it says in Hebrews, having our senses trained to discern good and evil.
by reason of use, by reason of practice. So I am practicing this, and I'm at this stop sign. I know that I have to go left, but without even thinking about it, I'm inquiring of the Lord, shall I go left? And God said no. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm really sorry I asked, because I am going to have a very hard time explaining to Dale that I didn't turn left because God said no. But David, you knew I was sitting out there waiting for you for lunch. I know. So I got this idea. I'm going to go straight. I'm going to make a U-turn. And I am not going to turn left. I am going to turn right. <laughs> that, that's exactly what King Saul did. That's religion. That's manipulating. So I, I you know, I, okay, God, I'll, I'll try to explain to Dale. So I, I'm going straight, and I'm running all this scenario through my mind. Now, two miles down Highway 41 is their old church, and it's a very liturgical church. And, and when they built the church, the new church, they, they sold that church building to the city. And the city now has had the property for maybe four or five months. And he had his billboard sign out front. And they had, they had a city meeting, and, and they said, take the sign down. He didn't. They had another city meeting. Take the sign down. He didn't. Well, now they had the, this city meeting, and they decided to fine him $100 a day for each day that this sign is not taken down. So it got his attention. So he went to the new church, put a sign on the, on, the, on the church explaining that to me and said, David, just come to the old church. I'll meet you there for lunch. So I'm driving down the highway two miles down the road, and there's Pastor Dale on the side of the road taking the sign down. God knew. That was God that, 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 that inward voice, don't turn left. God knew that. And God will lead you this way. He, he, supernaturally. I mean, you, you, you will find divine providence. And even when you screw up, you're going to find he's going to bless you because you're trying. Amen. And I, I told you the, the rest of the story the next day, I'm... I'm Going in, uh, in Mar and driving into Marquette, and I needed oil, and I needed gas. But anyway, I went to turn into a gas station to get oil and gas, primarily oil. And God said, "No, don't turn here." But oh God, I need gas. I need oil. My oil light was on, so I knew I needed oil. So okay, so I drove up a little bit further, and there was a shop go, kind of like a Kmart type thing. Shall I turn in here? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm in shop go buying a case of oil. And because every time, every time I buy, fill up with gas, I'm putting two quarts of oil at the same time. So I'm, I'm, I'm wheeling out of the store with my case of oil, and I hear a blue light special. Being a child of light, I can be in tune to blue lights. And they said... Girls' dresses, 50% off. Now, before I left on this trip, my daughter Sarah, three years old, or actually my, my wife said, honey, we need to get dresses for Sarah. We've gone through all of the, you know, all the gifts she, she got as a baby, but now we need to buy some ourselves. So I said, okay, what size is she? And so she told me she's three or something like that, with three. So I knew she, we, she needed dresses. So... Girls' dresses, 50% off. So I can, I can be, I come home and be a hero. The only problem is when I wheel my car over there, there's a mob of women. I mean, it's just a mob. I heard someone say they, they did some kind of analysis of men shopping for, for things like this. It's the equivalent of, of, of being trained as a fighter pilot. I decided I'm not going to try, and that, that is, that I'm not going to deal with it. That's a mob. But I noticed outside the mob was a rack of girls' dresses. So I kind of moseyed over there outside the mob, 
and it was all dresses that were like 50 to 75% off. So I said to a lady, I said, the, the 50% off, does that apply to this rack too? She said, oh, yeah, everything. Oh, cool. Now, I knew we needed size three. It wasn't a lot of them there, but I took three, four, and five. I just took them all. I mean, I'm going to be a big hero. Men shop different than women. I know that. But, I mean, it was an incredible blessing. I mean, $30 dresses marked down 50 to 75%, and then another 50% off. I mean, I felt really good. But I would have missed it had I, had I not been inquiring of the Lord. Something so simple. Hallelujah. Okay, let's keep moving. Where did we leave off? Let's pick up here on page 18. The various ways which God leads us by the Spirit. Inquire of the Lord. Be still, quiet. No, we're missing something here. Yeah, th that's not where we are. We're, we're on page 16. This is the best part. You can't miss the best part. Again, our inheritance is the ability to inquire of the Lord and always be in the right place at the right time. Obtain an inheritance. <clears throat> um, Greek word, klero, 2820, it, it means to a lot. Figuratively, to assign a privilege. And I thought we had a quote there from somewhere. Anywhere, this goes back a few pages to inheritance in Ephesians 1.11, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance. And again, that word there, being predestinated, that is the Greek word, Clairo to a lot. And so we have obtained, we've been predestinated to an inheritance. To obtain an inheritance means to cast lots, to determine by lot, to choose by lot, to a lot, to assign by lot on or another person as a possession. In the New Testament, make a lot, uh, and that is a heritage, a private possession. Okay, now. We have been predestinated to obtain an inheritance, just like the children of Israel. Genesis 49, where, where Jacob prophesied the, the boundaries and, and their inheritance. We have been predestinated for an inheritance. Now, in Acts 26, and if, if this were a red-letter edition Bible, you would see it would be printed in red because these are the words of Jesus in Acts 26. And uh, this is where Paul falls off the horse, right? Acts 26. <laughs> it's a common myth. Anyway, Acts 26, 14. And we all had fallen to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me, in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet for this purpose. I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will, I will appear to you delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm now sending you. To, now, here is the commission of Paul. This is his assignment right here. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, 
and that in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by me, by, by, by faith in me. This is incredible. That we are, we're, were delivered out of darkness, brought into the light, free from sin, and, and bottom line here, receive an inheritance. Hallelujah. But I've never, ever heard anybody teach on this inheritance. What is it? And it blows me away when I discovered it. And probably you too. This is, I mean, this is Jesus giving Paul the mission to bring us into the kingdom. Deliver us out of darkness into light, forgiveness of sins, and that we, we may receive an inheritance. Greek word for inheritance, kleros. Probably from the word we just looked at, inheritance, being predestinated through the idea of using bits of wood for the purpose a die drawing chances by implication a portion as it's so secured by extension uh, acquisition and especially patron patron patrimony figuratively let's jump down here to the meat we find this word in every gospel Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We find it at the crucifixion. What did they do to determine who would get Jesus' garment? They cast lots. What did they do to determine who to replace how or who to replace Judas? They cast lots. Like nine out of the ten times, something like that. Of this word appears every time it's translated casting the lot. Literally, literally, I'm saying literally, our inheritance being brought out of darkness into light, the forgiveness of sins, and the ability to cast the lot. That's it. That's the inward witness. That's the ability to walk in the supernatural by inquiring of the Lord. Well, you don't seem nearly as excited as I am. <laughs> it's awesome. Our good doggy. Our inheritance. The ability to inquire of the Lord. The ability to cast the lot. The ability to walk in the supernatural by inquiring of him. Whew. Our inheritance equals the inward witness. Some call it intuition. Others a hunch. Good or bad feeling, a red or a green light, or a check within you, whatever we need to develop this inward witness through practice. Like anything, the more we use it, the stronger it gets. Illustration of practicing turning your lap. Yeah, that's why we did that already. <laughs> Learning to drive a stick shift. Various ways that God leads us. I think we'll stop here because this really is a clear point of stopping without getting into the number of ways that God leads us. But by just brief, real brief overview, and maybe we'll come back at a later time and go into more depth on this. But the number one, the number one way that God's going to lead you is the inward witness. Second to that, and again, that's your inheritance. Number two is the inward voice. That is 
The inward witness is a yes or a no. The inward voice, you might get words. You might get directions. You might get pages. It's, it, it's God communicating with you what you need to know. And again, most often that inward voice is going to be responsive to you asking a question. I love Mark Berkler's teaching on this. And I've interviewed him a couple times on my Tuesday program. And he was struggling, a president of the university, but, but struggling with hearing the voice of God. And I'm not sure, I don't remember how he got to this place, but the, the long and the short of it is this. He says, just get into a quiet place and, and just have a conversation with God, something like this. You know, after you've had a little bit of prayer and just getting, getting quiet before the Lord, God, I sure love you and thank you for all you're doing. And I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of, of, of your leading and guiding and helping me. And Father, I, I just have a question. What, what do you think about this or that? And just be quiet. Now, what you want to do is be sitting at a keyboard or at a in a, in a desk with a piece of paper or a table and paper and pen and just begin to write whatever comes to you don't judge it don't try to analyze it don't spell check it just as fast as you can write whatever you think you're hearing and what you discover is probably 90% of the time you have a communication from God. I've, I've had so many friends I, I've shared this with that have practiced this and, and, and then what you always want to do is when you get something of profound, something that might affect somebody, you want to run it by some other people to get their opinion on what you're getting from God. But that the inward voice is, will give you information but again, we have not because we ask not. And again, by practicing, a dear friend of mine here in Wisconsin, who I've known for at least 40 years, probably more than that, but he spends three hours every day for the last 30 years. And he, he'll, he'll spend about an hour and a half just writing every day. And he has, he has, he fills up, he, he, when he goes through a legal pad, two or three legal pads a month, just writing. But what's interesting is writings that he has from four or five years ago are, are, are describing the days we're in today exactly. They, they were prophetic things. He, him asking about, you know, what, what's happening in the world economy or what, what, what's happening in, 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 in any part of life. He just wrote, just writes. But you can do it. And it's a good way to, to practice to hearing the voice of God. That's the inward voice. Now, the voice of the Holy Spirit is a little bit stronger. And, and that's where, as an, one example I'll share with you real quickly. I, I was driving a brand new sports car and probably too fast. I lived out in the, in the country here in Wisconsin. And I had just won this, this sports car from a, a company. And anyway, I'm, I'm, so I'm cruising down the highway real fast. And I hear it's Marsh Road. We, we, we lived in a wilderness area, so it was a lot of wildlife out there. But I'm cruising at 5 o'clock at night, and I, I hear this shout from the back seat. I mean, a, a shout. Stop! Talk about the voice of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I slammed on my brakes. And while I am sliding, my mind kicked in. What are you doing? You have lost your mind. I mean, I am sliding out of control, and, and there's nobody in the back seat. But all this happens in a fraction of a second. Within the next second, a gigantic, I mean, a, little, a, a bigger than my car, big buck doe, a buck deer went right across my, in front of my car. 
Had I not got that authoritative voice stop shouting at me, I can guarantee you I wouldn't be here today. But God, that, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the, those kind of things are rare, but they'll happen to you. The same thing happens with Samuel. Remember when Eli, Samuel was with Eli, and, and, and a couple times Eli said, well, Samuel, Samuel responded to Eli, what do you want? And, and Eli says, nothing, why? He said, well, you called my name. No, no, I didn't. Well, after three times, he says, that must be God calling you. It was a clear voice, and that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's also, closely related to this, would be an audible voice. And I, I don't know that I've ever had an audible voice, but that would be you know, in that same variety. And then visions, dreams, and trances, God will speak to you through those things. And we can see a number of examples in your notes here uh, of, of this methodology. And then prophecy. God will speak you know, prophetically to you. Personal visitation, another means. And in, in the dreams category, you know, let's share a quick story with you, and then we'll wrap it up for tonight. But before my wife and I, uh, well, before we got saved, we lived together. And then once we got saved, then we were living rightly, but her parents never believed us. They just ne didn't believe that we were really new creations. So anyway, we're, we're a couple of, couple of years down the road, and her, she lives in Kenosha. I'm, I live outside Milwaukee, and her, her brother is a, a race car driver down in Kenosha. So anyway, on this particular Saturday night, I go down and pick her up. We go to the races, and then I drop her off at her house because uh, actually, she drove up to my house and left her car at my house. That's what it was. She left her car at my house. We went down to the races in Kenosha. And then I dropped, because she lived down in Kenosha, I dropped her off at her house. She was living with her brother. Now, the next morning, I'm going down to pick her up for church. And I'm going down the highway, and a U.S. highway, a major highway, but there's a brand new stop sign. Wow, they put a stop sign up on Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, they wouldn't have done that. But I must have gone right through the stop sign twice, coming and going yesterday. Anyway, I, I, I'm sitting at the stop sign, just pondering this, and then, and then you know, I went. And then another four miles down the road, I come to another stop sign, that's supposed to be there. And while I'm sitting by that stop sign, her father comes through the intersection and he sees me. So he stops and he says to me, where's, where's Bip, my wife? Or, well, girlfriend at that point. Where, where, where's, where, where's my daughter? And they said, oh, she's at home. And he said, oh, no, I, I just drove by there and her car wasn't there, so I assumed she spent the night with you. I says, Dad, shame on you. <laughs> we don't do that stuff anymore. <laughs> he says, oh, okay. Well, anyway, I pick up, my, pick up Bip, and I'm coming back, and I'm telling her, you need to be aware, there's a brand new stop sign up here. On, on this highway. But when we get there, there's no stop sign. There's no stop sign. God led me by a vision so that our paths, my path, would cross perfectly with his path so he would know the truth about our relationship. God is so good.
Father God, thank you for this night. Thank you, Father God, for the many different ways you lead us. And Father, if we come together on the subject again, we'll get into much, much more depth. But Father, I thank you. The most important part of this night is the reality of our inheritance, the inward witness. And I pray, Father God, that we would begin to pay more attention that we would be purposeful in inquiring of the Lord. And Father, just being keen to listen to that still, small voice. So that, Lord, we would just walk in the supernatural. We would be in the right place at the right time. And I thank you, Father God, even when we messed up, screwed up, went the wrong way, that, Father, you would bless our hearts for doing what we could to walk rightly with you. Father, I thank you that you'll seal this message by your word and by your spirit. And, Father, we'll fulfill the purpose you have for each of us in our lives and ministries. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that awesome? That was just terrific. I just want to remind you to uh, inquire of the Lord on giving and blessing Brother David. The uh, envelopes are in the back of the seats. You can put it on the special blank and in the box on the table, and we'll make sure he gets that at the conclusion of the weekend. But uh, I don't know how many of you knew this. I know some of you wished us a happy anniversary. Yesterday was our 43rd anniversary. And so we bugged out a little early from work yesterday, and we went and hung out on our special bench at Point Beach. And then we went out to eat, and then we went to see our grandson. What's his name again? <laughs> well, who has a grandson named Roman? That's going to take me a little while. But anyway, just cute as a button. He's one month old today. And when I'm with him, I can't stop kissing his head. I think I'm going to wear all the hair off his head. But I'm practicing what Brother David has been teaching us. So we had eaten, and here we were at uh, Sam and Jordan's, our, our son's home, and uh, holding Roman. And I thought, you know, Cedar Crest would go good right now. You got to have your papa take you to Cedar Crest tomorrow, Okay. You like ice cream, right, Jaden? All right. You're going to be a, you're going to get some good stuff. So anyway, I thought I should do it. Brother David said, and I, I inquired to the, of the Lord. I said, shall I go to Cedar Crest? And I, I heard so distinctly, yes, yes. <laughs> and I realized it was Diane. <laughs> Which is almost equivalent to the voice of the Lord, right? So I'm on my way to Cedar Crest, and there's that mobile station. I can't remember the street I was going down, but getting ready to turn on Dewey to go over to Cedar Crest. And I noticed the gas sign, and I thought, well, the gas went down a little bit. I mean, we were just traveling down south to Arkansas, and I couldn't believe what we were paying for gas. But it was 374. I thought that came down some. And then I heard, you haven't gotten gas in a long time. And I looked at the gas gauge, and I never knew a needle could go that below, that far below empty. I mean, it was like it was, empty was here, and the needle was down that far. And then in panic, I glanced. You know, our vehicle has a range thing where it says how many miles left you have. And it said zero. <laughs> Now, the lowest I ever remember it getting, I mean, I've taken, I've had 17 miles on there, and I thought, okay, I, I can make it 14. I think the gas station's like 14, and I've made it with three left, but never zero. So I pulled a U right in front of the, the, uh, <laughs> the stoplight and zipped in there and got gas, and I thought, thank you, Lord, for... Uh, prompted me. So 
you know, it's not always in the big things. I mean, you can hear yes, yes about ice cream. Now, you might have to discern that voice. Or God will prompt you about gas, little things too, right? Hallelujah. You know, I just wanted to share in closing this evening such a great, great teaching. Um, in, in the pastoral ministry, we're dealing with people a lot. And I think that, especially being as we're in a Pentecostal church, and we're endeavoring to learn how to walk in the Holy Spirit and, and heed the promptings of the Holy Spirit, uh, this, this may seem just so obvious, and I know some of you have been here for a while and have heard me teach on this. But you can't hear from the Holy Spirit if you're not in the Spirit. You can't hear from the Holy Spirit if you're in the flesh. And over the years, particularly when people are, are get in a religious spirit, a religious spirit can be really nasty. And when you're angry and expressing vitriol, uh, there's just no way you're in the spirit. You're in the flesh right there. And all of us as believers need to check ourselves because we are susceptible to getting off in the flesh at times. And you got to learn to just lay low for a while. I say, you know what, don't say a lot right now because you're probably going to say the wrong thing. You're not in the spirit right now. You've got to get away and get with God and get, get yourself right here. And then maybe God can do something redemptive with this situation. But I think if husbands and wives would check themselves, how many arguments wouldn't just get worse and worse and worse until things are at a regrettable place? Um, and I, I tell you, I've had some people, pe people can get that way, and they really think that they're standing up for righteousness, just as vehemently as the, as the Pharisees did, but just nasty as snakes. You know, if you're being nasty as a snake, you're not in the spirit. You're not hearing from God. You're not speaking for God. You may think you're standing up as a tower of righteousness, but you're so far out in left field, you should just be quiet for a while and get in the spirit and have something. You know, I'm thinking of a, an event I had here relating to the daycare. This was almost a year ago now, and I had to talk to a gal about a difficult situation. I had her out here. And I'm telling you, she started lighting into me. There was somebody else in the church building at the time, overhearing this from down the hall, and they told me afterwards, you know, if that had happened at my place of employment, the cops would have been called and they would have been escorted out. I've never heard anybody talk to somebody like that. And yes, as they were talking to me in those tones, it was laying the law of righteousness down with me and really thinking that they were taking this great stand for the kingdom. And it was as ugly as ugly can be. Now, I had had lots of uh, encounters with this person, and I know that they love Jesus, and I know that they've endeavored to walk with the Lord. But in that particular scenario, they just got tied up in knots so bad. And it was just horrible. That's what we're capable of in the flesh. And... Um, you know, every, every service, I end by saying this to you. I don't know if you remember. I've been saying it for every service for 25 years or whatever. Go now in the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit, right? Righteousness, peace, and joy together. Am I walking in righteousness Am I in peace? You know, that teaching on the offense is so good. When you're in an offended state and you're all churning, you're not in the Holy Spirit right there. 
right? You got to get appropriate your peace again and get in the Holy Spirit and have the joy of the Lord. And then now you've restored the capacity to hear something from the Holy Spirit and do something that has an impartation of life. When you're in the, the, what did Jesus say? The flesh counts for nothing. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. You can't give life when you're in the flesh. So he says, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So it is true. The great attack of the evil one is to get us in offense, to get us where we're just a churning and we're in the flesh and we're just locked up. We're just locked up. So I think uh, at times this, this teaching is so good, but just don't overlook. You, you got to learn to monitor yourself, right? Okay, now here, am I in the Lord here? And husbands and wives, so, so critical. You know, you're, you're, you just have to learn to call time out when you're in the flesh because no good thing comes from that ugly, that ugly place, right? Hallelujah. Father God, help us as we endeavor to keep ourselves in the spirit walking in the Spirit. Thank you for this deep, rich, powerful teaching we've received tonight. And, Lord, we do want to more and more inquire of you over every issue of life. Prompt us, remind us, help us, we pray. May it be said of all of us that we are recognized as being full of faith and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Going on the righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. See you tomorrow night.